Okay, are there any questions about anything that we have covered so far in the class? Or any other questions that you might have about the class? All right, seeing lots of no's. So today we're going to continue with the health and stress section, which we started last Thursday. And then uh, we won't finish that today. We'll finish it on Thursday and move on to personality. Personality is a short chapter, so it shouldn't take long to get through personality and catch us back up to where we need to be when we hit psychopathology. So we just talked about primary appraisal. When something happens in the environment, we have to decide, is this thing that just happened, can we handle it or not? And what do we have that can make us get through this particular event better than another? And there's different ways to look at particular events. There's the harm loss, there's the threat appraisal, and there's the challenge appraisal. I talked about all three of those last time. But in our primary appraisal, we take into consideration a whole host of things. And the, we have to consider uh, the resources that we have available. So do we have the money available to take care of this particular situation? Our house burned down. <laughs> and do we, have the, do we have insurance? Do we have the money that it will take to, to rent out someplace until our house is rebuilt? You know, that's a huge uh, catastrophe, actually, for a person. The medical care, uh, when we get sick, do we have medical insurance? And the social networks that we have, we have we do, are there people that will help us? Do we, have we made friends that will help us? You can't make a friend while you're already stressed. <laughs> uh, while you're stressed, people that don't know you don't want to be around you because stress, your stress, stresses them out, and so they don't want to be stressed. Nobody does, and so they don't want to be friends with you while, the, while you are stressed if they haven't already made friends with you. But if they've already made friends with you, then they know who you are, they know what you're about, and they know this is not normal, and so they are willing then, if they're good BFFs, to help you through it. Uh, fair weather friends is a whole other story. It's people that are only there when things are good, and then when things are rough, they are not around to be useful. Uh, professional help also, if you already have a therapist or if you have other people that can help you to get through a particular problem, then you're thinking about that during your primary appraisal also. The personal skills that you have and the coping styles that you have, we learn our coping styles from our family and from our, our surroundings, our society, our culture. Uh, do you have the proper coping styles for this particular issue? We'll talk about coping styles in these lectures. Uh, the personal characteristics that you have, your physical health, if you're healthy and something happens, then you can handle it much better than if you're sick. If you're sick, then a problem comes along and it's much worse because you're already sick. And your constitutional vulnerabilities that you have, um, that you have been born with. The psychological characteristics, mental health, your self-concepts, your temperament, your self-esteem, your self-efficacy, all of these are taken into consideration when you have a, a stressor that occurs in your environment and you have to decide whether you can handle them or not, handle that stressor or, or not. And then the cultural attributes, uh, cultural definitions for, de for specific events in, the, in your environment. Uh, a culture determines whether something is going to be considered a stressor or not and how much of a stress it is. The American Indians and the typical Caucasian family in the United States are very different in the way that they look at a girl who has her first period. In the Caucasian um, community, and many times it is a negative event. It's like something, oh my gosh, you're going to have to worry about this for the rest of your life and this, blah, 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 blah. In the Indian community, it's a celebration. It's a wonderful event. It's a, hot, it's a wonderful time. And so we look at it very differently depending on what culture we're brought up in and the meanings of a particular event. And then the expected responses that you have that your culture determines how you're supposed to respond to a specific event in your life. 
And then the, the stressors, the way that the stress exists, uh, is it an environmental stressor like COVID? COVID's an environmental stressor right now. Uh, is it a psychological stressor? Is it a social stressor? I love the social stressors. How many of you are first generation uh, college students? Your family has never gone to college, your immediate family, the ones you live with, your brothers, sisters, if you have uh, extended family in the household, aunts and uncles, cousins, uh, but your mother and father is, is the typical two that will be in your family. Are you the first ones in your family to be going to school? And so I have at least three of you who are. Well, here's a social stressor. The family can look at this in two different ways. The family can say, this is wonderful. We're going to help you every way we can, and we're going to arrange our schedules so that you have time to study, and we're out of your way, and they do all the things necessary to help you. But then there's the family that goes, what? Do you think you're better than we are? You're going to college? We didn't go to college, and we've got, and we're successful. Why do you think you have to go to college? which becomes a very big stressor then, it's very different than the other side of the family situation. So social stressors, those are different types of social stressors. Uh, the dimensions of your stress as well, the intensity of the stressor that it exists in your life, uh, the duration of it, how long will it last, is it an acute stressor or is it a chronic stressor, and we'll talk about both of those in this lecture. And the rate, how often does it occur? Is it predictable? Can you predict the stressor? If you can, then you can arrange to have, to have it met with all the necessary things to meet that particular stressor to fix it, whatever it is, and reduce the stress that it, that it has on you. But if it's not predictable, if it just occurs whenever and you don't know when it's going to happen, then it's hard to deal with. All of this goes through your mind from the primary appraisal. And so we think about all of these things, and then we have our reaction to it that includes physical, psychological, emotional, and cognitive reactions to a particular stressor. Remember that each person responds to a stressor differently than another person does because of all they have. Everybody has different characteristics for your resources and your uh, personal contributions and existing stressor types. Uh, so we don't all respond to the same stressor the same way. However, there are specific types of stressors that are so large that we do go through specific phases because of that particular catastrophe. We call them catastrophes. And Katrina in New Orleans may, would be considered a, a catastrophe for the people that are in New Orleans, and we have hurricanes here on the East Coast and on the West Coast, but one big catastrophe that the whole United States felt was 9-11, when terrorists took over airplanes and became kamikazes and used those airplanes to to blow up specific areas in the United States. One of those areas was New York, and they hit the Twin Towers, and the Twin Towers fell. And one of them was the Pentagon, where a plane crashed itself into the Pentagon. And one of them, one of the planes was headed for the White House. But that particular plane was late taking off, and so it was still in the air after the other two had crashed, other three had crashed into their targets. And the people in the plane, the passengers, had cell phones and they knew what was going on. And they recognized that their plane had been hijacked and was headed for someplace unknown. It was headed for the White House. That was where it was supposed to go, was the White House. And they decided to take back the plane. They're going to either perish in the crash or they'll take over the plane and they have a chance then of living or the plane might crash and it did, it crashed in Pennsylvania. And there is a monument in Pennsylvania to that particular group of passengers. There's a monument at the National Cemetery in Arlington 
for those that were killed in the Pentagon. And my father's grave site is about five steps away from that memorial. And then there's New York. And New York is very different than the others. The one that hit the, that crashed in Pennsylvania, it didn't do much damage to any city. It didn't crash in the city. So there, were, there wasn't very much um, that people were recognizing it over and over and over again. The one that hit the Pentagon was cleaned up rapidly and people in Washington, D.C. don't normally see the Pentagon. It's not something you stare at um, as you're driving past. And so it was hard, people just didn't recognize it. But in New York, thousands of people are reassigned to different places to work because these Twin Towers are down. You have to travel around the city in different ways because the Twin Towers are down. There's this giant pile of rubble that you see every single day. You smell the destruction that occurred every day you cannot escape it and so they're reminded of it every single day they go in to work and they um, or go in for whatever else they want to go into to the city and they see this and they had a much worse time than the other um, people in washington dc or in pennsylvania so the five stages that a person will go through in a catastrophe do not mean that these are five stages that go from one to five. You can start off and be just fine and then go into stage one, or you can be in stage three and then go to stage one and two. And so it's just five stages. And if you list stages, if you list anything, you have to list them in single order, one, two, three, four, five. So this is just the way that we have recognized that there are five stages that we see people in during catastrophes, and here are the five stages. So the psychic numbness stage is often perceived as a deadening or numbing of feelings or experiences diminished responsiveness to the outside world. A person may have a loss of interest in one or more significant or previously enjoyed activities such as school or work or family life or outings or recreational activities or even intimate relationships, tenderness and sex. They may feel detached or separated from others or feel that things aren't real. This can't be happening. That, I'm, this must be a dream or this is, this is something I can't imagine that this is actually happening to me. They may be lethargic, listless, withdrawn, or depressed. In stage two, they go through what's called an automatic action phase. Automatic meaning robotic or automaton the automaton phase, it's almost like they've been programmed to go through their life like they used to go through their life, but there's no emotion involved. It's just a stage they're walking through their normal routine without any real commitment to it. It's just automatic. They've been programmed to do it, so they do it. And then there's the communal effort stage. During 9-11, there was a huge outpouring of connection because we didn't feel like New York had been attacked. We felt like America had been attacked. So even people in Los Angeles, California, felt like they had been attacked by these terrorists. And so the people who share the experience enjoy a sense of community effort. A pain shared is lessened. So there's a sense of great weariness and a loss of energy, but the day, that day when it happened, and the next day, there were American flags put up everywhere. People had American flags on their cars. They had never had them before, on trucks, on boats, on bicycles, on, on motorcycles. Uh, houses had, that had never had an American flag had American flags all over neighborhoods in uh, apartment complexes, all the balconies had American flags hanging off of them. It was a communal effort. Everybody came together. It was America. We are America. But like I said, in New York, every single day you're, be, you're seeing this thing and 
in California, they see it on the television, but then the news changes and you don't see it anymore. You're not living it every single day. And so those people in the West Coast, they recovered faster. And because they recovered faster, the others in New York and some in Washington, D.C. felt that they were let down. And this is called the letdown stage. When the energy is depleted and the victim can sit and think about the tragedy, then they can begin to comprehend the enormity of what has occurred. Along with this is a sense of abandonment when others get on with their lives and forget the tragedy occurred. Now, no one forgets. That's a bad word, forget. No one forgets that it occurred. You incorporate what happened into yourself. This is something that happened to me or to my country, and yet I can still survive. I'm alive. I can still do the things that I'm supposed to do. And so I continue on with this incorporated into who I am. This happened to me. And of course, there are places in the world where catastrophes happen every single day. Um, in Israel and Palestine, they're always fighting with each other, people killing uh, bombs going off, explosions, and this is something that's a daily routine for them. And so we, um, here in the United States, it was not something that we were used to, but in some parts of the world, it is something that happens often. Uh, but I remember, and anybody who, and we, we talked about this during the memory section, a flashbulb event or flashbulb memory, uh, I remember exactly where I was, who I was talking to, what was happening when the secretary walked into my office and I was in a meeting with Sprint trying to change our telephone systems to voice over IP. And our secretary walked in and said, the Twin Towers had been attacked by terrorists. Like, okay, so close the door, I'm finishing this meeting, and then I'll continue on and find out what's going on. But I wasn't going to let them stop me from doing my work, my job. That's their point, is to stop you. So don't let them stop you. And the recovery phase is um, the victims begin to adapt to their new life and include the experiences as part of who they are, incorporating the experience into you. Societal stressors are those that occur in society. Society is a massive, horrible thing for stress. It, it creates stresses all the time because itself is a stressor. So these societal stressors are stressful conditions arising from our social and cultural environments. Notice at, in my list down here that every 20 years or so, the preferred method of information exchange changes. I started in 1928 with this list, a reel-to-reel -reel tape player. Anybody have, have or had ever have a reel-to-reel -reel tape player? Did any of you? No, 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 no. I owned a reel-to-reel -reel tape player. My father owned a reel-to-reel -reel tape player and passed it on to me, and I still have one here in my office here. I still have a reel-to-reel -reel tape player. It's a giant reel of tape that you manually string through the device, the electronic device, attach it to another reel, the other reel turns and pulls the tape through, just like a cassette tape, but you have to do it manually, and it's a very, very large amount of tape, so you can put a lot on it, uh, not like a cassette tape, which has a lot less on it per time frame. And then you can record on it, or you can listen to what somebody else has recorded. The record player came along 20 years later, and it did not put the real real tape player out of business because you could certainly buy things that other people had recorded, but you could not record on it, on a record player. So the real real tape player stayed around still, but became less of a device, used device, because the record player sort of took over from them. Then the cassette player came along and put some pressure on both the real to real tape player, which, because it was a real to real, but the cartridge was already put together. You just slid it into the device and it would play. And the record players were, um, they were under attack then because of the cassette players also. The CD player was 1984, and we could record and store information on CD. 
the CDs were more reliable. And then the iPod MP3 player put them all out of business because an iPod MP3 player could do it all. You could get stuff that was already recorded and put it on there, or you could record your own stuff, and it was this big. You'd stick it in your pocket and carry it along with you and hook up earphones to it, and it was a full, the entire thing was all put together. You didn't have to have a cassette and a player together. It was, they were one piece. So that is 2001 when the MP3 player came along. In 1970, there was a book written called Future Shock. In 1970. <laughs> I still can't get over that. In 1970, he wrote a book, Future Shock, which talked about how people were having nervous breakdowns because society was changing too fast. <laughs> and compared to what we do today, change today, that was the pace of a snail compared to what, how we change today. So imagine then if people were having nervous breakdowns back in 1970, well, yeah, there's reasons why we have so much stress today. So here's a list of some of the things that happened to change in society over 127 years, right? So from, not, from 1837 to 1963, first is the telegraph, 1837. In 1837, you could send a message to somebody across the country almost instantaneously. You didn't have to write it, give it to Pony Express, and Pony Express would send it over there. It took weeks for it to get there. Now you could do it instantaneously almost, as long as they were hooked up correctly. And then the telephone in 1877, not too long after that, put the telegraph out of business. You could call somebody up and talk to them you could hear their voice. It wasn't just Morse code. Right? So uh, my great-grandmother refused to have a telephone in her house. She said it was the instrument of the devil. How could she in Chicago pick up this instrument and talk to her relatives in Philadelphia? No, that was, no, that, that's not reality and she didn't want it in her house and then the am radio in 1923 now where we are here in the north northeastern north carolina this is really relevant to us because in 1923 when the am radio was invented right here in the outer banks of north carolina was the very first government broadcast over am radio for weather report from the Outer Banks. And then reel-to-reel -reel tape players, as I talked about in 1928. The FM radio in 1937, it did not put the AM radio out of business right away, but how many of you ever listen to AM radio anymore if you even listen to FM radio? Most of us listen to FM, not AM. And then the record player in 1948, and color TV, oh wait, FM radio TV in 1947. That was black and white television. And then the record player in 1948, one year later. And then color television 10 years later in 1957. And I, it, that seems like a long time ago, 1957. I was born in 1957 when the color television came out. Now, the color television was out a little bit long before that, but it was completely unaccessible to normal people. In 1957, it became uh, able to be purchased at a normal price so people could purchase it, so it was available to the population by 1957. But we didn't have one. We had a, we had a black and white television in our house, and there are only three channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS. That was it. And the, <laughs> the television was huge. It's a massive device, and on Saturdays, my mom would get up in the morning before I did, and she would pull the tubes out of the back of the television and hide them. And I would come down and turn on the TV, and it wouldn't work. Just plug it into the walls. It's not working, Mom. Well, I guess you're going to have to go out and play then. So she got me to go outside and play instead of watching television. Then she'd stick the tubes back in there. And I blame her completely for the three electronics degrees that I have, because as a kid, I was like, there's got to be a better way to get a, a television to work consistently. 
And so I have three electronics degrees, and it's because of my mom pulling those tubes out. She didn't tell me till many years later uh, what she had done. So that's color television, 1957, and the cassette recorder in 1963. Now, when you listen to the mo to the movie online, he says it's the things that force us to change that causes us major hassles, major problems. When we can't, we're not allowed to stay where we were. We're not allowed to stay on that particular thing, device, do that particular behavior. Uh, that's what causes us issues. And so here's for 27 years, from 1980 to 2007. Right? So the VCR, 1980, you cannot buy a VHS cassette any longer. They do not make them. That was 1980, 40 years ago. It's a VCRs. Uh, computer, 1981, you cannot live your life without a computer anymore. I remember when I first started teaching, they told me I wasn't allowed to teach using the computer. I wanted my students to go out on the computer and, and do research. Like, no, you can't do that. I said, well, that's fine. Then I'm not going to make them go to the library either because they shouldn't be allowed to go to the library if other people don't have libraries in their house. We have the library at school, and we have computers at school. They can use both, either one. And so if you won't let me get them use the computers at school, then they're not allowed to use the library at school either. It's just stupid. <laughs> But 1981 was when IBM came out with their chiclet computer, home-based computer. Uh, cordless phones in 1982. These are, the, these are the radio phones in 1982. In 1984, the CD player. In the cell phone in 1985, every single year, it's like something else is coming out. Camcorder in 1988. Nobody has camcorders anymore because our cell phones do all of that for us. The pager in 19, the same thing. Uh, who has a pager anymore? Your cell phone does that for you. A uh, pager was a little device you hooked on your, uh, on your belt buckle, and somebody would call the phone number that was associated with it. It would buzz and show you the phone number that had just called that, and then you were to go and call them back. Well, of course, on every corner, there was a pay phone. How many pay phones have you seen in the last five years? Any? Has anybody seen a pay phone recently? No, they don't exist anymore. COA, when I first started, uh, you saw one in Norfolk. Wow. Now, was that in a, that wasn't in some sort of, you know, special place that they, they were just showing you what they used to look like, right? <laughs> it wasn't in a museum, right? <laughs> so, um, and it was actually working paper. And how much did you have to put into it? I remember putting a dime into them to be able to make a phone call. How much did you have to put into this to make a phone call? Do you remember? Do you, did you see? Did you look to see? I didn't use it. <laughs> it probably was more than a quarter, I bet. <laughs> so they, it was, it was, that's a change right there also. We, COA, when I first started to, to work at COA, there were pay phones in every building. Multiple pay phones in every building. There's not a single pay phone anywhere on a campus or a College of the Albemarle anymore. None of the five campuses have, have a cell phone. So, <laughs> sorry, pay phone. So, pagers in 1994 and one year later, the internet. 1995, you cannot live your life without the internet today. You, you have to use it. Doesn't matter what profession you have, you use the internet. So 1995, that's when that first became available to the, ma to the major public. The iPod MP3 player in 2001 and the iPhone in 2007. The iPhone put the iPod MP3 player out of business, the pager out of business, camcorder out of business. It was the, it was the best of all the cell phones. Now the, every cell phone is just like it now. And, um, and it, there's, you can't live your life without a cell phone anymore. But how many of you have Apple computers? Uh, sorry, how many of you have Apple iPhones? How many of you have Apple iPhones? What, what version iPhones do you have? The 11, an 8, XR, SE, 
XS, second generation SE, somebody in class has an 11. It came out in 2007, that's 13 years. There's already 11, 11 versions of it. It's only been out for 13 years. There's already 11 versions of it. You see how fast things change. I have a Samsung Mega, huge, giant phone. Love the phone. I can see it real well. So, <laughs> you get my idea. You know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so, this Mega has 2.4 Android on it instead of 8 or 9. I think 9 is the latest one for Android. But it doesn't have it because they refuse to make the 9 available for the Mega. It could run 9, but they don't make it available for it. And now 2.4 doesn't handle the newest software that's made, so I can't use the, the Mega anymore because of that, because I, I want the other software right, to be able to play Candy Crush on it. Well, you can't on the Mega. 2.4 version, and so I'm forced by the companies to change to a different phone because they won't put the version of Google on Android on it, and it's, it's perfectly capable of running, but they don't want you to do it because they want you to buy the new hardware. So they're forcing you onto new hardware that you don't want you don't need, but you're going to have to have it if you want to do any of the new stuff. So that is a change that's forced upon us. And when change is forced upon us, we have significant emotional events. And we have to find ways to cope. So coping strategies are ways of dealing with stressful situations that reduce or eliminate the causes of the stress. Reduce the stress or eliminate the cause of the stress, or reduce the cause itself. And to cope, you have to face the stress. Denial is not going to work. You can't deny that this particular event occurred in your life. You have to face it because you know it exists, and denying it because you, if you deny something, you have to name what it is you're denying. So you'll, it'll cause you stress otherwise. So social supports, I already talked about social supports. Cognitive restructuring is finding the silver lining in the dark clouds. I'm sure you've all heard, of, heard that saying. Find the good in the bad. My mom says, when something bad happens to you, it's the devil poking you with a stick. And if you respond negatively, he gets a thrill out of that, and so he continues to poke you. But if you look at the bad situation and find something good in it, then he's going to go poke somebody else. So always, this is cognitive restructuring, always find the good in whatever bad happens. Physical exercise is a good way to relieve stress. And we'll also talk about the ego defenses, um, which include denial, but denial is not a good way to handle this. Hassles are the little things that happen in your life uh, that cause you some tiny amount of stress. And I, that was your, your last, I think that was the last one, that was your last discussion question, well, what are the top five hassles in your life right now? And how do you handle those top five hassles? So situations that cause minor irritation or frustrations are called hassles, and it's the hassles in our life that cause us to go off on other people. So let's say you're dating somebody, and uh, you, now they're not answering your texts as fast, and they're busy sometimes when you want to go on a date, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, are they seeing somebody else? That's huge, huge. That's not a hassle. That's a huge issue. And we don't want to handle that huge issue because it's just, it's going to cause too much frustration and pain if, if it's true. And if it's not true, well, then you know, we're going to look like idiots. So we're not going to face that huge, massive problem, stressor. Instead, 
we're going to be walking down the street with our date and they're going to drop a, a piece of paper on the ground and we're going to freak out over the being, you know, litter bugs and destroying the environment. And they're like, whoa, because <laughs> yeah, it's a hassle, but you're making the hassle into something huge and you're going off on them because you can't handle the big things in your life. Now that takes care of the stress. Absolutely. You don't have the stress in your life right now because you just got rid of it by going off on this person, but it's going to come back because you really did not take care of that huge issue, the huge stressor. So we tend not to want to deal with the big issues. And so we exaggerate the little ones. Have any of you taken the social readjustment rating scale? I put it out there in the uh, section for our stress. Some of you have. Good. Some of you have taken it already. It is uh, a test out there to test how much stress you have in your life. So if some of you have not taken it, go ahead and take that. It's a very interesting little thing. Quinn's taken it. Uh, Anna's taken it. Lauren's taken it. So it's a psychological rating scale. It's designed to measure stress levels by means of values, a number that's placed on common life changes. Some of these changes will not have occurred to you because you're too young or not in, not working yet, or don't own a house yet, or whatever. But there are things that still will happen in your life. So take the tests and see what you got, what number you get out of it. But you will decide whether you're going to look at only six months, and then everything that's asked. If it happened the last six months, you you say yes. If not, you say no. And if you want a whole year, then if it happened in the last year, then you put yes or no. And each one has a rating associated with it. And all things create stress, good and bad. You can have a baby born, and that's a wonderful, very exciting time, but it's stressful also. You get married, and it's wonderful, but it's also stressful. You have some, you have divorce, big stress, and it's negative. In some cases, it might actually be you're happy about it, but uh, there's, Changes of just change your job, change your house, you know, rent from one rental to a different rental is a stress as well. So lots of different events are evaluated and your total score is calculated to determine how much stress you're experiencing. As a six month calculation, if you did it for six months and you have over 300 or a one year calculation over 500, you have too much stress in your life. You need desperately to find a way to reduce your stressors or reduce the reaction to those stressors. And the reason is because stress causes psychological and physiological pain and suffering, and it can kill you. It can kill you, which is why we talk about stress in this whole chapter. Some stress is good. Tiny little bits of stress that keep us charged up and ready to go and meet the challenges of life, like a battery. If you take a chargeable battery and you charge it all the way up and then you sit it on a shelf and you don't use it, it actually loses part of its charge even though you haven't used it. You have not used the battery, like you don't use your own body. You're not doing anything. When you go to charge that battery, you use the battery, then you take it off the shelf, use it, and then charge it back up again, it does not charge to 100%. It has lost that tiny amount of charge at the top because you did not use it. So you've lost a piece of the charge. Same thing with our bodies. We need to keep our bodies charged up, and we need to keep continuously being charged up. Have any of you ever sat one day, uh, it's a weekend, Saturday. You're like, I've done all my homework. I got nothing to do. I'm not doing anything. I'm not going to get out of my pajamas. I'm going to sit and watch movies and eat popcorn all day long. I'm not doing anything. Have you ever had that? <laughs> Some of you have. And so you just sit there all day long doing absolutely nothing. At the end of the day, the sun's going down, time to get up to actually, you know, take a shower, go to bed. And you feel miserable. Your head hurts. I'm tired. How can I be tired? I haven't done anything all day long. Why do I have a headache? Because you haven't done anything all day long, because you've had no stress at all in your life, 
and you need a little bit of stress. You need a little bit of stress. Now, bad stress has a name too, distress. Um, it can be harmful and cause physical consequences that you don't want. There are two major types of stress, acute stress and chronic stress. Acute stress comes and goes. You, when it starts, you go, oh, well, but I know it's going to end. And you know exactly where it's going to end. Or about. School is a good indication of an acute stressor. You started school, and you know it's going to be over in eh, about two years. Maybe a little bit longer. It took me three years. But a little bit longer, maybe, to get your degree, and it's going to be over. And you know it's going to be over. So you can decide, well, I know how much energy it takes and I know I've got that amount of energy, and I know exactly how much to structure to use every single day until this thing is over. So with acute stress, a temporary, temporary pattern of arousal caused by a stressor with a clear onset and a clear offset, and energy can easily be mobilized and manage to fight the stress. With a chronic stressor, it's completely different. You have no idea where this thing's going to end. And so you have no idea how much energy it's going to take out of your life, and you don't know how much to put into it because you could be, it could outlast the amount of energy you have, which is exactly what happens. So it's a continuous state of stressful arousal persisting over a large period of time, and you have no idea when it's going to end. It can be very hazardous. It's nearly impossible to determine how much energy to use to fight the stress, so we don't know how long it's going to last, and we don't know how much, how to approach it to fix it. The acute stress, a good example of acute stress, is the fight or flight response, fight, flight, or freeze. Something happens in the environment that scares you, you go into a fight, flight, or freeze response, a reflex action, and then it's over. So a sequence of internal processes that prepares the organism for struggle or escape and is triggered when a situation is interpreted as threatening. It can be innate response or a conscious decision of how you respond to that particular event. And the hypothalamus is the main brain structure controlling this reaction. In a chronic situation, you don't know where you are how long ago did this thing even begin, you lose track of it because you think that you're doing an okay job fighting it, but you're not. And so you go into what's called the general adaptation syndrome. It's a psychosomatic symptoms that are painful physical symptoms and increased susceptibility to colds and the flu that are caused by an increased psychological arousal and a loss of your ability to fight your immune system decreases because of the stress and your energy levels decrease because of the stress. And we see a three phase, three general stages that uh, exist in this general adaptation syndrome. This is, these are the stages. The first is the alarm stage during our primary appraisal of this particular event that's occurring. Oh my gosh, this is happening but how am I going to deal with it? I don't even know if it's going to end or not. So it's the alarm reaction, body mobilizing its resources to cope with a stressor, but how do we cope with a stressor that it has no ending as far as we can see? So we go into what's called the resistance phase. The body seems, seems to adapt to the presence of the stressor, but it really doesn't. We think we're okay. We forget what our normal level of metabolism is. The new stress has pushed us up to a higher level of metabolism, but we're existing at this higher level of metabolism, and we think we're fine, but we're not. We're supposed to be down here, not way up here in our, met in our metab metabolic functions. And then we hit the exhaustion phase. The body depletes all of its energy resources, and we can go into illness and even possible death. During this resistance phase, during the resistance phase, we um, have a situation we call the straw that broke the camel's back. Have you ever heard that saying, the straw that broke the camel's back? Some of you have. Some of you have not. 
Now, obviously, a piece of straw is not going to break a camel's back. But we're talking about a very specific instance where you have loaded that camel down with all of your gold and all of your silver, and you're going to cross the desert, and that camel has as much as it can, it cannot hold anything more, and that one little piece of straw that lands on its back, and it just collapses because it just can't handle it. And that happens to us human beings when we have so many things on top of us and we have just can't handle one more thing, that one more thing breaks us. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. My professor in college at my master's program, Dr. Pavlik, he talked about a time in his life when he was a child, when he was just being, uh, just driving a car, 18, 20 years old. He was pretty old when I, when I was going to college. And he said all the roads were dirt roads. There were no paved roads. And the cars had chokes on them. You pull the choke out, you start the car up, and you push the choke in slowly to let the car run. If you pull the choke out while the car is running and push it back in again, you force the car into a backfire. The car, bang, explodes. And now, it doesn't explode, but you have a big backfiring of the car because you push too much gas into it. So he would drive along the roads, and there were bushes along the roads to keep the soil from eroding because they were all made out of clay and dirt. So these bushes were along the sides of the roads, and he would drive along the sides of the roads at just after dusk. So the sun went down, he'd go out with his car hunting rabbits. And he would, as he was driving along, any rabbit that had settled down in any of the bushes, here's this monster noise coming at them. They would run, and rabbits do not run into the darkness. They run into the light. So he has his lights on, and they jump in front of the car and start running in front of the car. Now the rabbit is in the alarm phase at first, but then eventually gets into the resistance phase where I don't know what it is that's behind me, I don't know when it's going to end, but I'm okay. I'm doing all right because I'm staying away from it. He pulls out the choke, pushes it back in, car backfires, rabbit dies of a heart attack, stops the car, picks up the rabbit, goes on to hunt the next one. <laughs> and that's how he used to hunt. And it's a good, a good example of the resistance phase. One more thing will break your back. One more thing, will you can't handle it anymore, and you break down. You have a nervous breakdown. You, um, get, you get colds easier. It's all kinds of things that can happen to you because one more thing, I just can't handle it. And I'm sure every one of you has been in a situation where you just, there's just too much going on. COVID, this COVID, this is just too much. Can't handle it anymore. And there are some students who have dropped out of school because they just can't handle anymore. One more thing is just too much for them. The gas exhaustion phase is the last one, and this one will kill you, where the, you, have been, you have been fighting and fighting and fighting this event, whatever it is, and your metabolism is way up here, and you have not found a way to reduce the stressor or its effects on your body. You have not found a way to get rid of the stress, and you can be killed. And steroids do this. If you use steroids too much, your steroids are pushing you up to a higher level, and you feel fine because you get used to the higher level, but it's not where your body is supposed to be. And this is what killed Kermit the Frog. You all know the Muppets, I'm sure, and you all know Kermit the Frog. And the man who invented the Muppets is Jim Henson. And Jim Henson invented the Muppets, and he was the voice of Kermit the Frog. And it was his baby. And he wanted it everywhere. In, in, he wanted it in radio shows and in television and movies. He wanted international to go to other countries and be in different languages. And he pushed and he pushed and he pushed and he pushed 
And his friends and his relatives were saying, you need to take a vacation. No, no, I can't take a vacation. We've got too much to do. We've got too many things going on. Got to get over here and got to get over there. And, and he caught a cold that should have just been a cold. And he had nothing left to fight it. And he died, basically, from a common cold because he had nothing left. He had used up all of his energy. His immune system was totally compromised, and the common cold killed Kermit the Frog. Do you get that? Do you understand this gas syndrome? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. This is where I stopped last time in the, in the, last, in the morning section. So I'm going to stop here as well. And I stopped here with the morning section because I showed them the video. But there were glitches because of the video over Zoom. So I want you guys to watch the video that is in the section of our class for health and stress. And this is the video right here. And I want you to watch that video yourselves uh, because it's important that you know the material that's in that for your life. It's an old style, I think it was 2003 it was made, so it's kind of old, but it, it is still pertinent to today. So, and that's where I'm going to end the class then today. Are there any questions? Do you have any questions? I'm seeing lots of no's. If you do, stay and talk to me. If not, have a great Wednesday, and I will see you on Thursday. Bye. Stay safe, stay healthy.